on this project titled That's the Place for Me, African American Homesteaders in the Inland Northwest. So just to give you a quick introduction, I became interested in this topic through learning about my own family history. I found out that I have some homesteaders um, who came to Montana in about 1915. Um, and when I was learning about the like, sort of things they experienced, I became interested in how other groups of people also experienced homesteading in the Inland Northwest. So I began to, to look at other groups, in particular African Americans, and I noticed that examinations of African American homesteaders primarily focused on the Midwest, so Kansas, Nebraska, um, and even Tennessee, Lower Michigan. But none, were, none really looked at homesteading in the, in the American West. So my literature review, this is a short excerpt from my literature review, really, really played this out. Um, Dr. Pintar Taylor, he was one of my primary sources. I used six or seven sources from Dr. Taylor. Uh, his focus mostly is on African Americans in urban cities as, as wage laborers. His discussion of African American homesteaders in, in the Inland Northwest comprises about one page out of his 500 page dissertation. And his was the most comprehensive out of all the sources I found. So African American homesteaders really were a group that wasn't looked at. From my literature review, I developed these research problems. First, I wanted to know why African American homesteaders decided to migrate here to the Inland Northwest. Most of the individuals I'm looking at came from the Deep South, so it's almost the opposite end of the country. So they came almost as far as is possible. And I wanted to know why they decided to do that and how they got here. Also, I wanted to learn which barriers prevented their success. I broke these into two different groups, natural barriers and social barriers. My literature review also told me to expect that as ex-slaves, most of these individuals should be illiterate, so I shouldn't find any written sources. My initial reviews of sources played that out. I found uh, actually no written sources. So I actually spoke with Dr. Taylor over the phone, and he told me about this collection, the Black Oral History Collection here at Washington State University, which is a group of oral histories that he actually performed here in 1975 of several African Americans. Um, using the oral histories from this collection, as well as oral histories from the University of Idaho and the Latak County Historical Society, which is the Historical Society for Moscow, Idaho, those are the primary sources that I used. Also, I corroborated the, the uh, information in these three different groups of oral histories, along with government documents and newspapers, and the text of different pieces of legislation that would apply, such as that, the actual text of the Homestead Act. Also, I used local newspaper articles from a local newspaper called the Deary Enterprise from Deary, Idaho, which is about 15 miles south of Moscow. These are the three groups of individuals my research focuses on. The first is Joe and Lou Wells. They came in 1889 to Deary, Idaho from North Carolina. The second in the middle here is Eugene Wells. He came in 1898 to Moscow, Idaho, along with his father and three of his brothers. And then Calvin King migrated in 1903 to Desmond, Idaho, it is halfway from Moscow to Coeur d'Alene. And he came with four of his children and his wife. Eugene Settle came from Louisiana and Texas area, and then Calvin King and Joe and Wells also came from North Carolina. So looking at the actual Homestead Act of 1862, it, it's important to, to learn the background of this, of this legislation first. So federal land rights, federal land rights, excuse me, have been hotly contested since independence, and actually before that. The original way of claiming land was to actually walk out with some stakes and just walk around the borders of some land you wanted and hammer in a couple stakes, and that was your land claim. There was no controls on the size of land or on who could even go through this process to, to own land. So originally, right after independence, uh, land, land use, or land became a source of income for the national government before taxation, which wasn't approved until World War One. Up until that point, federal surveyors would go out, they would survey land, and the government would sell it off to try and generate income for the United States. The South opposed any free land programs. Free land programs were programs designed to encourage people to move out of the cities of the East and into the, all the open land, open land in the Midwest and the Far West, to try and develop the land and get them enough population to turn into states instead of just territories. The South opposed these programs because they feared that anti-slavery ideas from the North with these immigrant heavy cities, they feared those were the primary individuals that would go west and take up this new land. So they feared that these new states would all become free states instead of slave states. And that would overrun uh, the Southern vote in the Senate and in the House of Representatives. Free land legislation was passed by the House of Representatives, which was controlled by Republicans in 1854, 1856, and 1860. 
each of these three different times it was passed, the key Senate committees were controlled by Southern Democrats, so it was, the bill was never even looked at in the Senate until May of 1860, after these Southern Senators left the Congress at the beginning of the Civil War with the secession of the Southern states. So with all their opposition gone, Republicans were left in the Senate, and they voted it through. President Lincoln signed it in on May 28, 1862. The Homestead Act granted 160 acres of land for a small file fee. It gave a family five years to what's called prove up, which required building a permanent homestead at least 12 by 14 feet in size to cultivate <coughs> at least a portion of the land, or if the land proved to be um, inhospitable to agriculture, you can convert it to a timber claim. Although this process was actually very difficult to go through. There were also no racial qualifiers. This is one of the first laws in the United States that deliberately says that there is no you do not have to be white or black. There's no uh, racial qualifier on the law. And this is one of the first to do that. All you have to do is prove that you are a citizen or that you have the intent to establish citizenship. So that made also newly arrived immigrants um, able to use this law as well. Go, yes, go West, Young Man is a quote that is taken from Horace Greeley. He's one of the largest advocates of free land legislation. He was also the editor of the New York Tribune. And while he was advocating for people to go west to try and get out of these immigrant clogged cities, uh, that's not the reason these individuals came. Eugene Settle said that one thing I was thinking was, in a pioneer setting, it's easier maybe for a man to be judged just for what he was worth, what he does, not what his nationality was or his color. Conversely, Franklin King said he got so sick of all the prejudice, he's referring to his father, that he swore he wouldn't raise a family and all that prejudice. He first came out on a trip to Spokane to kind of survey things. He kind of liked it, so he went back, bundled up his things, and they went. And these, <clears throat> these two statements are, are the best out of the oral histories that I have. I really show that they came west to try and escape the prejudice system, that, the prejudice of the South, and the, the legal segregation systems that were forming after the Civil War. So first we're going to look at some natural barriers that they experienced to their success, and then we'll look at some of the ways that they overcame these barriers. There are very large differences between the inland northwest and the south where these individuals came from. There wasn't any historical information uh, available that I could compare with, that I could compare back then in the 1900s and even before that. So instead I used um, rainfall in 2012 this year, March, April, and May, the first, the first really rainy months that have a lot of influence on how crops will perform that year. In North Carolina, the average for March is almost four and a half inches almost three inches for April and four inches for May, whereas the inland northwest almost reaches one and a half inches in March, 1.25 in April, and just over one and a half in May. So the inland northwest actually receives only 38% of the rain that the south does. So as these, as these individuals came to the inland northwest, the environment was so different that the farming techniques they were used to just didn't apply. Eugene Settle even comments uh, that they told him he couldn't make it up there, that it would be awful hard for a man that's from the south that's been used to farming the way they do down there, and to come up here and try to make it. He said there was nothing up there but wild horses, jackrabbits, and sagebrush, which is a very accurate depiction of the inland northwest, I think. Another natural barrier was terrain. Much of the land available for homesteading um, had ex a very steep um, gradients on it, as well as being very um, densely forested. This is a map here of a survey taken near Desmond, Idaho. This section here is the King Homestead. He began his homestead in this plot here, which is the 160 acres I mentioned earlier, and quickly expanded it with this when his son uh, turned 18. He then filed his own homestead claim, and then the two combined it together. Now, on this map, you'll see there are all kinds of contour lines. These aren't quite as accurate as a map you would see today with contour lines, but they are still represented. They'll show you relatively flat pieces of land, such as here, where there are a few lines compared to these areas where the contour lines are very close together. Now you can see that there's very little land here that is actually usable for farming. These areas with the close, with very close contour lines have approximately 60 to 70 percent inclines on them, which is far too steep to even be able to run horses on, to be able to plow very, with, with very much effectiveness. The only areas in this region that are actually able to be farmed successfully are the areas the kings received and this area right in here. All the rest of this land actually is too steep to be farmed. But all of this was given out as, as homesteads. So whether or not you received a piece of steep land or flat land 
water to use for irrigation or not, kind of dependent on luck. And that really plays out in the experience of Franklin King here in the Spokane Land Office. He says, it's just like a gambling deal, you see. You went up there to the land office, and there was a bunch of numbers on a board. And you just pointed to one and said, this is the number I want. It was just a luck thing. You see, at that time, all the section marks existed only as a survey, and all the section marks and posts were there, and these numbers was on the section posts. It just happened that on one of these hitching posts, he found the number he was looking for, and that number was home. For African Americans who lived in Spokane Land Office, there was actually a large blackboard full of numbers. You just picked a number. There was no map. You didn't know where your number would end up being. And also adjacent numbers. So, for instance, if you picked number 39, and your son picked number 40, that did not mean those two pieces of land would even be next to each other. They were just assigned random numbers. So you really had no idea what piece of land you were going to receive. What we don't know is whether or not this practice also applied to white homesteaders, or if this was only for African American homesteaders. I couldn't find information to be able to tell that. And also, this is only at the Spokane Land Office. One of our other homesteaders we're looking at today, uh, Joe and Lou Wells, they were actually able to pick out their land south in Deary, Idaho, which came out of a different land office, the land office in Boise, Idaho. So there's also some difference in the land office they used. To overcome natural barriers, African American homesteaders used an intelligent approach and diversified their income sources to offset the natural limitations that they faced on their farmland. Joe and Lou Wells first came to farm. Their farm very quickly failed in the first season. So in order to diversify their income, instead of just giving up homesteaders, they looked to some other methods. Joe Wells here was a very successful logger in North Carolina before he came. So he turned to logging. He first logged his own land, and then he began to work as a contractor for Potlatch Lumber Company. So times he would have a contract through Potlatch, he wouldn't need to, to farm or to cut his own land. And then when his contract was full, he could return back to logging. Also, Joe Wells then built a, a home a very large home, far larger than he needed, actually, just him and his wife. And they rented out rooms as a sort of halfway house, which also provided a third source of income. Eugene Settle, him and his father took a little bit different approach. They didn't have any special skills, so him and his father both took jobs as ranchers. They worked for an individual named um, Mr. Crispin. And while they were working for Mr. Crispin, they they had a really hard time making ends meet, so they decided to approach uh, their resources as a way to intelligently overcome their limitations. They built a subterranean cooling system where they actually diverted a stream underneath their house and built a large rock basin so they could open up a little floodgate inside their house, and the bottom of their house underneath would fill with water, and they would store meat and, and other perishables down in the, in the cool spring water underneath the house. So that was a, a very unique way that they decided to overcome those barriers by making their resources last longer. For Calvin King, <coughs> he, he received the land we looked at earlier, which was relatively flat. So his farming actually worked out pretty well, but his land was very heavily timbered. Working with him and all of his children, a total of nine people, he could only clear a, a, an area of land equal to five acres every year, which is the equivalent of 25 square feet in a day, which is actually about one-fourth the size of this room we're in now. And that includes clearing brush, clearing out weeds, and cutting down trees, and then burning all those remains. Um, his first few years, he grew barley and oats to feed horses and cut lumber. So he also relied on lumber for additional income at the beginning. And then as the years went on, he was able to clear more land. He became very used to how <coughs> the Inland Northwest environment affected farming. He had been a successful farmer in, the, in, the, in North Carolina, in the South. And so as he grew used to the land, he was able to become more and more successful as a farmer. So by the time his land was totally cleared and there was no more lumber left to cut, he was able to switch primarily to farming using the, the skills that he had learned from his new environment. So he was able to adapt over time. So by the time he did need to rely entirely on farming, he was able to do that successfully. The next thing we'll look at are some social barriers to success. The first is legislation. Western territories tried to prevent black settlement, and this stretches back to long before the Homestead Act uh, was, was even a thought in Congress. The first we'll look at here is a bill to prevent Negroes and mulattoes from coming to or residing in Oregon. This is the most famous here in the West. It was passed in 1847 by the Territorial Legislature, and it prevented anyone from, with, uh, everyone with African American heritage, or even with suspected heritage. So even if you were maybe, let's say, uh, what they would consider one quarter black, you were prevented from even entering the state. It was repealed a few years later, but it was passed again in the state's official constitution in 1857 and was not removed until 1926. It wasn't enforced that long, 
but just the fact that it remains there for so long is, is evidence that these laws were really prevalent in the West. These laws existed in every territory in the Western United States. They prevented African Americans from voting, from testimony in court, from marrying whites, uh, a variety of different activities, serving on a jury also. So Franklin King, you remember these individuals came to the West to try and escape this, this sort of treatment from governments. He said, I didn't see a lot of difference between back there, referring to the South, and here. Another social barrier was segregation. This is another thing that they left the South specifically to escape, but which they encountered here. Several inland Northwest schools separated the white and colored children of homesteaders. It's unclear whether or not these actions are from individual teachers and their personal beliefs, or if this was actually an institutionalized practice. But Franklin King recalled in his oral history that there was about three families that were Caucasians, and then there was two or three like us, and she wouldn't let us kids play together. She made those kids play in one part of the school grounds, and us kids play on the other side. <clears throat> Additionally, another social barrier was stereotyping. Uh, African Americans were generally considered to be somehow mentally inferior, dumb, foolish. Um, as the Franklin, as the King family were able to succeed, as we mentioned earlier, with slowly adapting to their environment, they produced a very successful farm. Around them, white homesteaders continually failed while the, while the, while the King family succeeded. And the white comment to them was that the darkies don't know no better, was that. This is really hard. We're leaving because we're smart. They're staying because they don't have the ability to understand how hard this is. Eugene Settle commented about his father that his word was as good as gold, but they didn't trust him. They didn't know whether he was any good or not. I imagine there was times that it would have been better if he would have been another color. Eugene Settle's father had a very difficult time acquiring, acquiring loans through the local banks in Moscow, Idaho, because of the color of his skin. He just wasn't trusted. They didn't think he had the ability to be able to pay the bank back even after he had eventually become a successful homesteader after several years. So we'll look at some of the ways that they overcame the social barriers. And in the case of the King, the King family, they actually weren't able to overcome this barrier. Um, instead of finding a way to work around this problem, they became very reclusive. Uh, the King family avoided contact to minimize the impact of racist le legislation and discrimination and stereotyping. But even in 1973, when his oral history was given, all the King brothers still had never sought any connection with any of the local towns. They avoided the question um, of how they how they dealt with these kind of kind of situations in by their um, interviewer in their oral histories. Franklin King, the only thing, closest thing he would say is, "I would say it's a free life. At least I think so. You don't have to take the discrimination of living in town." That's the only thing that he would say. This led me to believe that he and his family experienced some extreme discrimination when they did go to town to sell their, their agricultural goods. Um, so much so that he wasn't even willing to talk about it in his oral history. For Eugene Settle, his family approached this, this, top, this problem with a, different, with a different method. They formed social networks with other African Americans to help each other succeed. The individual they formed a social network with was a man named Mr. Crispin, who was a local successful African-American store owner in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, his father was considered untrustworthy to lease land until a black businessman, Mr. Crispin, personally vouched for him. Mr. Crispin had been there for about 10 or 15 years, so he had an established set of relationships he was able to draw on to offer help to the settle family. Unable to finance a loan or be able to purchase land, Crispin actually gave the, the settle family money from his own business to be able to enable them to purchase the tools, seeds, and land that they needed to continue. Joe Wells approached this barrier with a very different method. He attacked the issue of race head on. Immediately upon arriving, he turned himself Nigger Joe and formally called his halfway house Nigger Joe's. I did have a picture of the house with the sign at the top that my children seem to have turned it into a drawing of a fish. <laughs> So the picture, I couldn't, wasn't able to find the picture again to put it up here. Um, but we'll talk more about this. And also, he used this joke frequently. I am the only white man in the Spud Hill area. The rest are all Swedes. So we'll look at how he used these two to approach this barrier of involving race. By using such a derogatory term to himself, he took away a lot of the power that this word had. When another individual would try and use a derogatory term against him, and he didn't just use this one. He used several to refer to himself. It takes away some of that power. Instead of an, of an individual applying this term to you, he's calling you something you already call yourself. And that takes away a level of its effectiveness. 
Additionally, <coughs> his joke about everyone else being Swedes is very important if you understand the context of race in the 1890s. White individuals were not white. No one was considered white. You were considered your, by your ethnicity. So you were Polish, or you were German, or you were Norwegian, or you were an American. And all of these existed on a linear continuum, a hierarchy of race, is what it was generally called. So if you were Polish, you weren't as good as if you were Swedish. And you weren't, if you were Swedish, you weren't nearly as good as a British person. And if you were Austrian, you were very far down on this continuum. So all immigrants were looked down upon as non-natives. Now, when he came to the city of Deary, Idaho, he was actually the only one of American birth. Everyone else were immigrants. Most of them, like he says, were Swedish. So he's able to use the fact that he actually is of American birth, even though he is not white, to use that to gain himself a certain level of social power, actually. And we have evidence for this in several different forms. The first is that the, in all the years of publishing, the local newspaper never referred to him by his race. They did refer to other African Americans who would pass through, or African Americans here in Pullman, or even in other cities, even in national news. They would always attach a race descriptor, but that never happens with Joe Wells. Um, additionally, even his place, even the name he called his own place, was never called by the same name. Instead, it was called Joe's place, or Old Man Wells' place. Additionally, his relative social standing enabled him to hire white workers. This photograph here is an interesting piece of evidence. If I can make it click on the right part. This is Joe Wells here on the left, and these are two of his sons. And this individual here is a white employee of Joe Wells. And this, this photo was taken in about 1900. Um, in 1900, most places in the West had laws that prevented this sort of relationship from ever occurring. But Joe Wells was able to establish enough social standing to hire um, white workers, and he actually had several, according to the oral histories, but this is the only photograph I can find, without any sort of controversy. The final and possibly most um, important piece of evidence is on his death in 1925, every business in Deary was closed to commemorate him and what he had done for the town. In this town, him and his family were the only African Americans still in 1925. This is an era when segregation is in full force, and this is an entire town of white Americans in a very, very racially charged time that closed upon the death of, a, of an African American. <coughs> so it's important to understand stereotypes of African American pioneers. Around the same time, around 1900, white actors used a kind of comedy routine called blackface. This is a poster here of a white actor who has used blackface to, or black makeup to cover his entire face that also covered their hands and their chest to try and mimic African Americans. Their depiction of African Americans would would be as clumsy, foolish, or unintelligent individuals. Regarding pioneers, they showed them going out west and foolishly, mindlessly almost, just picking at the ground. And if something grew, then they were successful. When it didn't grow, they would just wander into the cities and become wage laborers because that was easier for them mentally. They couldn't handle the challenge of farming. Was This is how they were depicted in about 1900 when all these homesteaders were working in the Indian Northwest. And, oh, and also to a degree, these stereotypes actually exist in scholarship that is being produced today. All of my, all the sources I reviewed in my literature review say mostly the same thing, that African Americans came west, they tried to farm, when it didn't work, they just went to go work as the wage laborers. There's no evidence in any of the existing scholarship that African Americans really attempted to overcome their environment at all. Either they were, either they were successful or they weren't. My research challenges these stereotypes, both the traditional stereotypes and the ones that exist in current scholarship, by showing that African American homesteaders used a very intelligent approach to overcome these barriers. They used a diversification of income to reduce their dependence on farming. They formed social networks with one another of mutual support to overcome challenges. And some of them, such as Joe Wells, faced issues of race head on and were able to establish some sort of social standing for themselves. Also, there's there was a premise I based a lot of my research on in the beginning that African Americans and African American, African American homesteaders, I'm sorry, were illiterate. And this is argued in every one of the sources I noted in my uh, literature review. This is the 1920 census of the, Cal of the King family. This is Calvin King and his, his family here. And every one of these individuals under education says yes for what they're able to read and what they're able to write, except for the Bible. So here we have evidence that these individuals were able to read and write. Also, since finishing my research project, 
I was also able to find another one of these census papers for the Wells family. I wasn't able to actually get a copy of it, unfortunately. But it also says that all of the Wells family were able to read and write. So already I'm also finding evidence that argues that these individuals were not illiterate. So further research needs to focus a more intensive search on more written sources. These sources don't exist in any known archive today, so they likely are held by individual families. Many of these, all, all three of these different homesteader families were successful, and their families actually still live on the land that was originally homesteaded. So it's likely that any written sources that do exist are probably still with those families. Also, evidence indicates that many of these individuals had extensive financial resources upon their arrival in the inland north. Joe Wells, for example, came over from North Carolina and he immediately was able to spend several hundred dollars to buy a logging team of very, uh, very large, powerful horses. So the, the existence of this money upon their arrival suggests that these were not even poor individuals, which is also another thing that the literature review suggested. So <clears throat> further research needs to be done looking at the connections between their finances and the distance of migration, particularly if migration to the Inland Northwest was so expensive so as to exclude the poor poorer classes of the South. So in other words, are the African American homesteaders who come here to the Inland Northwest only the most successful, almost the, the elites of the African American populations that they're originating from? And also, are their approaches uh, taken by these homesteaders representative of the majority of black pioneers in the Inland Northwest, or even in the entire American West? I would like to thank the Ronald E. McNair program staff for their amazing support as well as my fellow scholars. Also, the Audible Scholars Research Fellowship, they, in addition to the McNair program, provided uh, funding for this research project. The Lanza County Historical Society, um, in particular Anne Cathy, spent many, many hours with me in their archives looking over oral histories and photographs, and my mentor, Dr. Robert Bowman, who could not be here today. Are there any questions?